Serious diseases such as measles and mumps that many thought had in fact been almost eradicated are on the increase and that's not just here in Ireland, it's a worldwide problem. The World Health Organisation has just announced that in the first three months of this year, cases of measles increased by 300%. And the reason is because vaccination rates are declining. So what's to be done and how extreme might the measures need to be to counteract what the WHO regards as a top global health threat? Here's Ethan O'Brien. I think sending your child unvaccinated into a school is an extraordinarily irresponsible and dangerous thing to do. Last week, Minister for Health Simon Harris sparked a debate about whether the state should get tough on parents who refuse to vaccinate their kids and ban them from our schools and creches. Yesterday, the WHO announced that the measles rate rose by 300% worldwide for the first three months of this year, compared to the same period in 2018. Last year, more than 83,000 people in Europe developed measles. Um, measles had been almost eliminated from Europe. That rate is three times higher than um, seen in 2017, and that's 15 times higher than was seen in uh, the previous year. 73 people died, mostly um, kids. And it's the same in Ireland, where over the last three years, the number of cases have jumped from 43 in 2016 to 76 last year. And between January and March this year, we've already had 49 cases of measles. And for mumps, the jump in numbers for this year is even more dramatic. For the first three months of this year alone, there were 913 cases of mumps, compared to 575 cases for the whole of 2018. Doubts about the benefits of vaccinations for measles and mumps were raised in the late 1990s, when Andrew Wakefield published a now discredited study linking the measles, mumps and rubella vaccination to autism. The paper was retracted and the doctor was struck off the medical register. But the fallout is still being felt today. We're seeing those cases coming back, I suppose, because of vaccine hesitancy, because um, parents who in the past were worried about the health of their children and chose not to vaccinate them. Their children aren't immune to these conditions. People travel a lot and these viruses can travel uh, across countries very rapidly. Um, and then because there's no immunity, children are, are susceptible to these illnesses. Dr John Fitzsimons is a paediatrician who has seen firsthand the devastating effects of a measles outbreak in Ireland in 2000. We had, you know, dozens of children admitted into the hospital. I think over 10, 12 children went to the intensive care unit and three children died during what was a relatively small um, outbreak. Uh, and I think that just kind of certainly gave me uh, the impression that the measles is not something to be trivialised and, and even in a small outbreak like that, it can, it can result in, in a huge consequence. Dr Fitzsimon says that many parents don't realise how serious measles can be for a young child. For many people, measles is a benign disease, um, but for a small and significant minority, it's not. You know, one in 15 children with measles will get pneumonia. One in 500 to one in 800 children with measles will die. Uh, they may die from pneumonia. They may die from the fact that measles lowers our ability to fight regular infections. So it, it weakens our immune system for a period after we've had the infection. And then there's a, a, a condition called measles encephalitis, where the measles virus affects the brain and uh, that happens to about one in a thousand children uh, and again that, that can be devastating with either death or um, uh, long-term uh, consequences uh, on, on a child's development and behaviour after that. Vaccination rates for MMR are at 92% which is below the required level. Close to 95% of children need to be vaccinated for the whole community to be protected to have what we call herd community, immunity. Uh, I think if, if, if we don't have that, then children and, and, and communities are at risk. Amid concerns about outbreaks of measles across the globe, some states in Australia have banned unvaccinated children from childcare centres, with their parents also losing out on welfare payments. In France, a couple received a suspended sentence for refusing to vaccinate their children. Across Europe, a number of countries from Slovakia to France have made it mandatory for children to receive the MMR vaccine.
MMR is not the only vaccine that has caused controversy. More recently, Ireland saw one of the steepest drops in the cervical cancer vaccination rate, from a high of 87% down to 50%, which some attribute to a strong online anti-vaccination campaign. Jonathan Irwin believes his daughter suffered side effects as a result of the HPV vaccine for cervical cancer. He says that banning unvaccinated children from schools is a step too far. It was not a great thing for the child. Could never be educated because the mother took a view that they didn't want that particular vaccination. I think the thought of the state coercing parents to force their child to have a vaccination, which they just may disagree with, they may not want. Now, I would say for things like measles, mumps, polio, you know, go and get your child vaccinated straight away. But that's not up to me, it's up to the families. And it's certainly not up to the state to tell you, I mean, are we living behind the Iron Curtain? What is this? Scientists say that any association between the HPV vaccine and other illnesses is purely coincidental. We're quite confident that the uh, vaccines don't cause um, these illnesses. We know that the rates of these illnesses um, is identical in vaccinated and unvaccinated uh, individuals. They occur throughout life, unfortunately, so they can occur at any stage from late childhood right up into the 80s. Um, but they do have a tendency to occur at a higher rate in teenage girls. Many doctors believe that vaccinations are one of the most important medical advances of the 20th century, but society doesn't always appreciate the benefits. Vaccination has been a remarkable success, it's probably contributed more to public health than almost any other intervention, maybe apart from clean motor. Um, it's, it, it's done more for us than, than what antibiotics have done. Um, but because it keeps you well, it's hard to have gratitude for, for vaccination. You know, uh, we, we don't see the benefits of it uh, because uh, the condition doesn't happen. It's hard to measure what you cannot see. One woman that did appreciate the benefit of vaccinations was the late Laura Brennan, who spent the last months of her life speaking out about how her cervical cancer could have been prevented if she had access to the HPV vaccine. The HPV vaccine can and will save lives save people from being in my position. So if I have to scream and shout about it to the day I die, I will continue to do that. With help from people like Laura Brennan, vaccination rates for HPV have jumped from 50 to 70%. The question for government is whether stories like Laura's could be more effective than any policy forcing parents to vaccinate their children. Ethno Brine there. I'm now joined in our studio by David Robert Grimes, who's a physicist, a science writer and a cancer researcher, and from our studio in Cork by Conor O'Mahony, who's a senior lecturer in constitutional law at University College Cork. First of all to you, David, I know you're a strong advocate for vaccinations, but measures maybe like mandatory vaccinations or barring unvaccinated children from school, are they steps too far? Are they too extreme? I think if we frame it that way, it's, it sounds really extreme. It sounds kind of draconian. But the reality is, this is not something that occurs in isolation. You can't simply make a choice for yourself, go, well, I won't get vaccinated and that's just about me. Because actually we all live in a community. So, for example, if you can't be vaccinated because you're immunocompromised, maybe you're very young, very old or have cancer, and someone else decides not to get immunized, that affects you in isolation. The other thing, or it doesn't affect you in isolation, mm. sorry. The other really important thing to realize is that um, these measures aren't as, as, as insane as they sound. For example, to choose not to let children into a school if they haven't met a certain threshold for vaccination. In France, it's 11 uh, vaccinations you need to go to school. And in uh, Australia, as it mentioned in the voiceover, that there's just uh, one. Mm. It, they're very simple requirements and they're there to protect everyone. It's not just something you can decide arbitrarily, this is for me. We live in a society and we have to think of others as well. Conor Mahoney, from a legal perspective, would we have constitutional issues, I suppose, forcing either mandatory vaccinations on parents when their child, you know, aren't immediately ill or barring children from school who aren't vaccinated? You could potentially have issues, Miriam. I think uh, in the event that such a law were to be passed, 
there are certainly arguments that you could make as to why such a law might potentially be unconstitutional. Uh, so that would uh, reflect the fact that our constitution provides very strong protection for the rights of parents and of families. And we saw in 2001, the Supreme Court was asked to make an order compelling a child to have a PKU test, which is a heel prick test for newborn babies to uh, screen them for certain diseases. And the court refused to do that. Uh, in that particular case, uh, in the absence of an immediate and serious risk to the child's life or health. So that case could obviously provide a springboard for mm. a potential challenge to laws of this nature. Or alternatively, if you were to pass a law saying that children could not attend school unless they've been vaccinated, uh, then you could have that challenge by reference to a child's constitutional right to free primary education. Uh, so those are arguments that could be made, but it's important to say those are arguments, not conclusions. And of course, there are counter arguments on the other side as well. And interestingly, tonight, David, I noticed our Minister for Health actually tweeted saying that we need to do everything possible to counter anti-vax myths. I intend to form an alliance of clinicians, policymakers and patient advocates to work on this. So clearly there is a strong feeling from the Minister's point of view that he's trying to counteract, especially, I think, information online. Absolutely. And this has been a growing global problem. Um, we have diseases that were almost eradicated. Uh, we've had mumps outbreaks in Dublin. Measles uh, vaccination rate in the UK is currently 88% when you need 95% for herd immunity. That's the difference between no one getting sick and an epidemic. We saw 82,000 cases in Europe last year. The year before, we saw 25,000, and the year before that, 4,000. So this is a huge problem, and it's being driven by anti-vaccine activism because it's scaring parents, and they get, they get uh, risk-adverse, and they think there's a risk because okay, they don't vaccinate. Okay, but on that, David, I suppose, like, even some parents emailed us in tonight. They, mm. There are concerned parents. They're just worried about their children. Absolutely. And could it backfire? If you take the sledgehammer, for instance, of mandatory vaccinations or barring children from going to school or aren't vaccinated. Could that just have a counter effect, actually, so they wouldn't send their kids to school? It's a really good question. So the research on vaccine hesitancy says there's two types of vaccine hesitancy. There are dyed-in-the-wool anti-vaxxers who've been around since the time of Edward Jenner in the 1700s. They will never change their mind. We've tried, we, they've researched this to death. We've looked at ways. They won't change it. They're not the majority. The majority of parents who aren't vaccinating are hearing things online and they're getting scared. And I fully understand their fear because if you read some of the things that people write about the MMR vaccine or the HPV vaccine and you didn't know any better, that would terrify you. But I think you have to capture hearts and minds here. And you used uh, Laura Brennan in your clip and Laura gave up her, her energy, her time and her privacy yeah, to, to yeah. capture people's hearts and to show them this is what it's about. This but is, is the reality. But is that the way to do it then, like the way Laura did, capture your hearts and minds? Absolutely. A mixture of education and hearts and minds is what will change minds. But in the short term, if we have emergency situations, we will have to look at being, and, and Connor would know more than me about this, but... Yeah. Connor Manny, on that, I suppose, even the minister's tweet is interesting. They obviously feel there's quite, from the minister's perspective, quite a lot of disinformation out there that, in fact, frightens parents. Can you do anything about that legally? No. Uh, not really, no. I mean, ultimately, that's a question of free speech. People are free to say things, even though those, those things might potentially be untrue or might be uh, potentially damaging. We, we see often during referendum campaigns, for example, that people spread an awful lot of misinformation. And really, there's not much you can do about that. Uh, but as to the question of whether you could pass laws that would uh, provide for compulsory vaccination, uh, I mean, I think uh, while there are arguments, as I mentioned, that could be raised for why those laws uh, might be unconstitutional, there are also arguments for why laws like that uh, might survive constitutional scrutiny. Uh, David mentioned one, the fact that vaccination, unlike the PKU test, which I mentioned earlier, uh, does not just affect the individual child, it affects society as a whole. So that public health dimension is one key distinction. Uh, a second one would be that the Oireachtas is often given by the courts quite a bit of latitude and discretion around matters of social policy. The courts continuously say that social policy is something to be made by the Oireachtas and not by the courts. And the PKU case was not made mandatory by legislation, which was one part of the reason why the Supreme Court declined to order uh, the test in that case. So if the Oireachtas were to legislate for it, uh, then you'd be in a different legal space. Uh, and the last point would be that in 2012, of course, we uh, passed a referendum to amend the Constitution to include a new provision on children's rights. Uh, now, that hasn't seen much in the way of scrutiny from the courts yet, but potentially that could strengthen any argument by the state to say that it would be legitimate uh, to pass laws to say that um, vaccinations should be compulsory in order to protect children from these, these illnesses. Okay, Conor O'Mahony, incredibly clear there. Thanks so much for all your uh, 
advice there. And David, thank you very much for coming in as well.